Good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Sagar Kapoor, and welcome to this Connect. I'm a part of customer success team at Tableau. This Connect is all about connecting you with the art of data visualization and storytelling. So it started as a small project with one of the Tableau ambassadors in India, Divya Bharti, last year in May. And it was all about how exactly we can connect our data family with our Tableau Zen masters to, and get inspired and learn from them, right? So, so far we have hosted close to 31 sessions. There has been 38 speakers, including 10 Zen masters, 5,000 attendees. We have a YouTube channel and I will share the details about it. Uh, we have a LinkedIn group, go ahead, connect with each other and start learning. And this has been possible because of our amazing data family. So thank you to each and everyone for coming and presenting on Guest Connect. So as I was talking about, go ahead and check our YouTube page, subscribe to it. So all the sessions which are presented on Wisconnect Connect are uploaded to our Wisconnect Connect YouTube page. Just go ahead and check it out. And the data speaks for itself, right? So this is some analysis which I got like for the last one year, we have close to 5,000 views. People have watched our video for 602.7 hours and we have 642 subscribers on our YouTube channel. So data speaks for itself how amazing content we have on our YouTube page. So go ahead and check it out. As I was telling about, we have a LinkedIn group by the name of Wiz Connect. Go ahead, connect with each other, learn and collaborate. And let's come back to today's session, right? So we are a data company and I want to understand what impact has this connect we are getting, right? So just to talk about today's session, we have around 61%, 61% of people, for them it's the first disconnect session, so warm welcome to them. And people are joining from all around the world, right? So that's to see the incredible impact of this connect. One thing which I track very cautiously is about whether people have Tableau public profile or not. And today's speaker will talk about why it is important to have a Tableau public profile. And just to make our Wiz Connect session more impactful, we try to understand which version of Tableau desktop we are using. And by the way, we released to 20.2 also, and it has some amazing features like metrics, relationship and all. So without further ado, let me introduce to our speaker today. His name is Kevin Flerich. Kevin Flerich has 15 years of professional experience in data analytics and is genuinely passionate about data. He's a Tableau Zen master and works as a senior analyst and Tableau developer at Unifund, Recovery Decision Science, a financial services and technology company led by a fellow Zen master, Jeff Schaefer. Kevin is also a Tableau public ambassador, has four Ironways top 10 finishes, and is the fourth most favorite author on Tableau public. And the fun fact about him is that he has a twin brother who is also a Tableau Zen master, Ken Flerich. And today, Kevin will talk about simple steps to improve your design in Tableau. So Kevin, over to you. All right, thank you for that introduction. Let me share my screen and put that in presentation mode. So. All right, yes, thank you guys for having me. This is um, the second time I've presented for, on BizConnect, and I think I was one of the first two or three people that presented back in April or, or May of last year. So it's been almost exactly a year, so I'm excited to be back. So Cigar did a great job of introduction, introducing me. My name's Kevin Flerlage. I'm a senior analyst and Tableau developer at Unifund. Unifund is a, a, a small company, about 100 people, it's a financial services and technology company in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's led by Tableau Zen master Jeff Schaefer. Jeff has been a, a he's a, been a Zen five different times. This is his fifth year, and the guy literally knows everything about Tableau. So it's been great to to learn underneath him. He's a he's a absolutely brilliant guy. So, um, and as Sagar also mentioned, yeah, I've got this uh, this twin brother. So that's me on the left, and and Ken on the right. Ken is, uh, we're, well, we're both Tableau Zen Masters. There are 41 of them in the world, including the, the Hall of Fame, and uh, we are two of them. So it's pretty cool to be in there with your identical twin brother 
And we share our website, flowridgetwins.com, and that's uh, been really gained a lot of success lately. So uh, uh, really exciting. I Cigar really did a good job of it, of, of introducing me. I'm a Tableau Zen Master. Of, uh, I'm a Tableau Public Ambassador. I have my Tableau Public Ambassador uh, sweatshirt on right now. Um, I've made one move up. I'm actually now the third most favorite author on Tableau Public. It's it's weird. It's uh, I'm I'm super competitive. So I I love that I'm uh, I can kind of move up the ranks, and I know it doesn't mean a heck of a lot, but uh, it, it's just something that with my competitive nature it, uh, makes me happy. I have four Iron Viz top 10 finishes. I'm the co-leader of the Cincinnati Tableau user group, which unfortunately due to these circumstances, we haven't really been able to do. And because of that, um, I help um, found and, and co-lead the, the data fam community jam. If anybody's had a chance to, to jump on those calls, it's, uh, we're trying to do them worldwide and we have four speakers for 20 minutes and it's, it's backed by the uh, Tableau Fringe Festival and uh, Tableau itself. So we've had really, really great success with that. So, um, so for me, and this will apply to the last session I, I did with you guys, it's most presentations I do are, are very technical. They're more how-to how sessions. Um, you know, things like fixed LEDs and new features and dashboard actions and mapping, Tableau Prep, you know, last time I presented with you guys, I, we did a couple of these. So we looked at new features for 2019.2, and we looked at platform containers and mapping and um, uh, parameter actions. So really hit three of these, these five. So almost all the presentations I do are like that. Even at the conference, Ken and I talked about, you know, going beyond and showing me doing custom charts using um, mathematics, using trigonometry. So that's kind of a norm for me. but People often ask, you know, what about design? And and it's tricky. It's really, really hard to teach design. Um, when Ken and I were young, 8, 9, 10, 11 years old, what we used to do is just sit and draw all day long. We would just for hours and hours straight, we would draw anything we could think of. Um, I remember drawing a lot of transformers. There was this thing called Mad Balls. There were these balls that had these weird faces on it and garbage bags. There was lots of, you know, cartoons and things. And we would just sit for hours and hours and draw it. In fact, when Ken first introduced me to Tableau, he had been using Tableau for a couple of years. He was actually a Zen when I first started using it. And he, he gave the analogy of Tableau is the closest thing to uh, like when we would sit and draw for hours as kids. So that, that, was, uh, that was the hook for me. That, that got me really, really interested. We, we love to do it. In fact, here's a couple of drawings from when we were eight or nine years old. So that's the, the Grinch on the left. That Ken drew that and Pinocchio on the right. I drew that. And we were about the same age. You can see the wear and tear on that paper. Um, it's 30 year old paper right there, but uh, we love to do it. And Inevitably, we got the question, how do you draw like that? And kind of like design, hard to teach, right? It's, it's not something that's easy just to say, all right, here's how you draw. I really think design in Tableau or any medium is very much like drawing. And I think it can be challenging to learn. So I do think, you know, you know what, what's it take to, to learn how to, how to design or how to draw? I think have some natural talent makes sense. I think that's helpful to give you a, a, a head start, but I don't think it's necessary. I think you need to train and practice and emulate others. It's, um, you know, just like anything, if you want to master something, uh, you need lots of training, you need lots of practice. People that make it to the Olympics spend the whole lives focusing on it. So it's, it's something that we shouldn't expect that we would just be good at. Um, it takes training. And one of the things I always tell people when they first start using Tableau is, you know, get involved with community, get involved on Twitter, or on LinkedIn, and watch what other people are doing. You know, watch people on Tableau Public because uh, so many of my designs have come from emulating others, from being inspired by the work that somebody else did, you know, by Ken, by Jeff Schaefer, by Adam McCann. So emulating others certainly helps with our ability to design. 
Uh, a quote from Paul Rand said, design can be art, design can be aesthetic. Design is so simple, that's why it's so complicated. And I really think that that fits. Design is simple, um, um, but it is incredibly complicated. So the goal of today is to take design and try my best to make it simple. What we're going to do is talk about kind of two examples on, and we're going to do this 26 different times. We're going to show an example of bad design, and that's going to be denoted by this, this red uh, down, thumbs down, and we're going to look at an example of good design. Okay, so we'll look at them side by side, and, and hopefully we can start to understand the differences. Um, so just a quick example here. Um, bad design, that's my brother, and good design. So um, that's a little joke. I, I'm sure you guys are all cracking up right now. So anyways, bad design, good design. So my definition of design is going to be used really, really loosely today. We're going to talk, you know, color, layout, alignment, aspect ratio, size. Um, some of the things I'm going to talk about are, are best practices. We're going to be really detailed on things that you really should never do because it's a best practice. Sometimes I'm going to talk about, you know, designing, you know, using color for um, people with um, um, color blindness. We're going, to use, we're going to talk about things that are really, really important. We're also going to talk about things that are just aesthetics. We're going to talk about things that are, don't do this because it looks terrible. <laughs> so, um, so my design term is, is going to be used very, very loosely. And, you know, I'm not going to try to teach you everything about design. Um, we're not going to try and talk about, you know, use an illustrator or anything like that. We're going to keep it simple. And the intention is I'm going to show you, you know, a chart and I'm going to show you how to make it better. So hopefully that, that, that'll work out. No need to take notes or anything like that. This, this is all uh, built out in a, in a blog post. You may have seen it before. Um, hopefully, verbally, we'll, we'll get, you'll get a little bit more out of it. But uh, if you want, just take a picture of this, or I can share the slides with, with Cigar, and he can share out with you guys later. Um, but uh, you can go to this blog post. It's going to give you every single detail, probably even more detail than I'm going to give you today um, reg regarding design. All right, let's get to it. So I am going to jump right. Oh, I forgot to open the workbook. What was I doing, Kevin? Had everything else prepared except for that. And sorry about that. All right, put this into presentation mode. All right, let's get right to it. So you'll see really quickly on this first slide uh, that. Um, how, how we're going to show this. So on the left, we're going to always show uh, an example of, of poor design or bad design or not very good design. And on the right, we're going to show it better. And I'm not going to claim to be the best designer out there, um, but I think these simple steps will, will show you um, things that can be impactful. So, all right, we're going to start off. We're going to do this 26 times. Um, we'll go now. So title, really simple. Uh, provide a title on your data visualizations. I've seen um, dozens of times where people, hundreds of times where people just put a viz out there and you have no context. You don't have a clue what this thing is, is talking about. So really simple, add a title to it. I've seen lots of different things, um, uh, storytelling with data, Cole, Noss Bomber, uh, Maplick talks about, you know, putting a question in your title. Um, you know, sometimes people say you need a title and a subtitle. Uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, suggest any of those. I'm just going to say put a title. Make sure that your your readers, your users understand some kind of, have some kind of context for what you're talking about. So in this case, we're looking at sales and profit review. This is super short data. So quickly, we understand what we're looking at. Okay. All right. Grid lines. On the left, we see a bar chart, and we see these really dark grid lines. Now. I don't mind grid lines here. You know, I think a lot of people would tell you to just get rid of grid lines altogether. Sometimes I do that, a lot of times I don't. I think grid lines can be very, very helpful, but grid lines are not helpful when they take over visualization. I think on the left, what you see is those, those grid lines just take your attention. You are drawn to the grid lines versus the chart itself. And with so many grid lines, it's really difficult to tell how, you know, the length of those bars. I, I don't know 
what those bars are really representing. If I, I take some time, okay, I see that red bar is a little over 320,000, but it's just so much information. It's in increments of 20,000, which just is too intuitive, and it just really takes over the viz. It's hard to look at, it's, and it's not aesthetically pleasing in any way. It's, it's ugly. So if we look at the example on the right, what I've done is reduce the number of grid lines. I don't have any horizontal grid lines. My, my bars are horizontal, so why would I really need horizontal grid lines? I don't. So I've gotten rid of all the all the horizontal grid lines. I've made the vertical grid lines very, very light. I think I made them dotted lines and really light gray. Uh, and then I've um, only showed them every every fifty thousand um, dollars. So you can. Um, you can see it's just a lot cleaner, and we can quickly see, you know, this is this $300,000 line. We can kind of estimate what these what these are. So, really clean design, and what it does, and if you compare these, is it lets the chart come to the front and not the grid lines themselves. All right, I've got three different examples of hex maps. Hex maps can be of the U.S. or Europe or India. I mean, I've seen hex maps for just about every country. Um, I've seen hex maps for the entire world. So. Um, Hex maps are pretty common. Hex maps are really good if you if you not used hex maps very much. Uh, have a hex map blog post. If you go to this this is on Tableau Public, you can click on these links and go to the different um, associated content. Um, but generally speaking, hex maps are good to not um, give visual weight to larger larger areas. So, for example, um, the state of Montana is. In, in terms of area is like 10 times the size of New Jersey, yet New Jersey has 10 times the population of Montana. Um, so we use a hex map often to, to not give visual weight to, to, a, um, to a, a country, you know, a, a, a state or um, a, a county or a country. Um, we kind of count all the different states as equal. So that being said, I see lots of mistakes using hex maps. One of the mistakes I see is using the wrong shape. You can see here we've using what I would call a horizontally um, horizontally oriented hex shape. The the, the points of the of the um, hexagon are are um, pointing left to right or pointing horizontally. And what you see the problem is they don't fit together right. A lot of people the little term that people love to use is tessellate. They don't tessellate which means they don't fit together. We have these weird gaps between it. And you can read the chart just fine. I can read this chart just as well as I can read this chart. It just looks bad. <laughs> and, and I said we would talk about some things that just don't look good. This just doesn't look good. So we want to use these vertically oriented shapes. This is the, the only reason we use a vertically oriented shape is because um, the originators of the hex map and, and Matt Chambers is, I believe, the first person to ever do it in Tableau, he just built out XY coordinates to, to fit these shapes, and he did it using these vertically oriented shapes. He didn't do it using horizontally oriented shapes. So they fit together uh, properly when you use that right shape. So just use the right shape, and they'll fit together really, really nicely. Part two on, on hex map is, is spacing. So I see commonly that we have all the space between hex maps. It, it, it's makes it hard, harder to read, and it just doesn't look very good. There's just no reason for all that space. So one of the things that I always um, suggest is make your, if you're using the shapes, that just make your hex shapes as, as large as possible um, without overlap. So I like to have a little bit of space between them, just a little tiny bit of white space, and I just make them as, as large as I can for the space, space that's available. And the third thing I would talk about is Make sure your horizontal spacing is is the same as as your vertical spacing. So we see here where we're almost touching vertically, but we have this space um, horizontally. And this is really a common problem I see, and it just it looks um, sloppy. It just doesn't look clean. Um, so I would always advise, like I said, make them as large as possible without overlap and having a little bit of padding between. I'm going to pop open this hex map blog post. So this blog post that I wrote actually. This is probably my second blog post I ever wrote. Um, it was originally on kevinflurlage.com, but it breaks down the history of the hex map, the reasons why we use them. You know, I mentioned visual weight out here. We can see, um, you know, things like this is Montana, and it just looks, it's so much bigger visually than, say, New Jersey. So this is why we use 
use a hex map. And this blog post tells you, you know, kind of the history, but also gives you all the different options you can use for a hex map. So this is the shapes I was just telling you about. There are shape files that you can just click on the geometry. This one is from, oh no, this is a, the polygon one from Roddy Zakovich. Uh, this is from Joshua Milligan. This is a shape file. This one's from Luke Stanky. This is a shape file. Um, I, I really love, if you're going to use a shape file, I really love Luke's because it does have some padding between these. I think it looks much better than them shoved right next to each other. Same with you know, the polygons. Um, I tend to use shapes. I just think they're easier. Um, so if you have any questions about that, you know, certainly check out that blog post. All right, enough about hex maps. Rotated text. I, I do want to let you guys know this is the first time I've done this presentation in person. So uh, I hope I don't run long. I'm going to try and push through and uh, uh, we'll see how it goes. So just want to let you know that uh, you guys are seeing it first. So, all right, rotated text. So in this chart, we see the months of the year. We see a bar chart and we see the months of the year rotated. And, um, you know, when I used to do data visualization in Excel before I even realized, oh, used Tableau, I used to do this constantly. Okay, how else would you do it? How else would you show um, these long dates? And, and the problem with this rotated text, is, as you can see me in video, I literally have to turn my head like this to be able to read it. <laughs> and the truth is data visualization is supposed to make uh, the job easier for, for our users. So why make them go through that pain? And it's just, it's just really hard to read. So uh, what I tend to do is abbreviate that. So if I have some space, I'll, I'll, I'll use a three-digit um, month, you know, like MAR for March and APR for April. Um, but if I have really tight space, I'll just use one, one letter to, to um, abbreviate it. I think we all know the, the, the months of the year, so March, April, May, June, July, we can see that really quickly. Even though we have two J's in a row, we know it's June and July. And then what we do is we use an extra blue pill up here to, um, to show the year. So really quickly, we see all the 2017 uh, bars, we see all the 2018 bars, and we can see the months pretty quickly just with one digit. So I always prefer to abbreviate months or my figures in any way if I can have them, um, if I can avoid rotating them because it's just, it, it's so much work on, on your user. So avoid rotated text when possible. Floating bars. So this is one of these, um, probably not always necessary, but it was one of the things that Jeff Schaefer kind of drove into my brain from, from the last, uh, you know, year and a half of working with, with him is, um, this is a Stephen Few thing. This is a, a Ryan Sleeper thing. If you know Ryan Sleeper, um, uh, five, another uh, five times Zen Master. Um, their, their suggestion is don't let, allow your bars to float. You have these bars that are just kind of floating in the space. And, and how Ryan Sleeper puts it, and this, this blog post is to Ryan Sleeper's um, uh, website, is give your bars a foundation to sit on. Give your bars a solid foundation. How we do that is, is to Give it showing the these a zero line or an x axis or an axis not an x axis but showing an axis line um, just so we give this foundation we give this starting point so this is more aesthetics um, I don't know if analytically it makes it any better but um, it's something when I see floating bars it just drives me nuts now so uh, so give your give your uh, your bars an axis to sit on all right categorical colors. So um, on the left, we're looking, this is all Superstore data, you probably already noticed, but on the left, we have all the different subcategories, and we're looking at sales by subcategory. And we have a color for every single subcategory. So what happens here is, yeah, okay, you, you could say that this just gives my user more information, but if you look through and you really look at the different studies done in this area, what you find is that when people look at a data visualization with all this color, they start to think that color means something. It represents something. Sure, it represents here, it represents subcategory, but it, it, it makes people think that it represents more than that. So what you find through research is that people spend time, spend energy, spend brain power trying to figure out what those colors mean, trying to figure out what it represents, when truly the only thing it represents is subcategory. In this case, there's absolutely no reason to use color like that. Um, 
So what I recommend is you, do, you have some, a situation like this, just use a single color. Or you can use, say, um, you know, a gray, and you can use a red to call out, you know, the, the top most sales or whatever particular category that you're interested in. Maybe you, you lead the project manager for chairs, and maybe we would, we would highlight chairs. So um, try not to use a different color for every single um, category in your, in your data if it's unnecessary. Now, I do think there's times when it's helpful. So I'm going to jump over to a biz that I created. Um, this got Viz of the Day a couple months ago. This was, you know, personal work. It was talking about um, uh, the gross revenues of money uh, movies in 2019, and, and I used sort of categorical colors. I used these different colors for different months, and one of the reasons I do that is because I use those colors all the way throughout. So we can quickly come and look at, say, this scatter plot, and we can see, hey, I know where January is, or I see December. Um, so we can tie these back really quickly without having a bunch of ugly labels or things like that. So that's probably a good use for, for um, categorical colors. And this is probably going to refresh on me like everything else I show on Tableau Public. Uh, and if I click the button, we're going to toggle between months and we're going to look at distributors. So in this case, I'm using color to show different distributors. So, for example, Walt Disney. Um, they put out Avengers in 2019, <laughs> excuse me, and they, their revenues are through the roof. So it allows us to kind of tie these things back. So I think ultimately this is a good use of color. We know that red represents Disney. We can see all these uh, movies that Disney put out that led to the most revenue by any, um, any company, any distributor in 2019. So probably a good use of, of categorical colors. But in most cases, it, it doesn't make a ton of sense to do it that way. All right, so this is one of these that's really, really technical and very important. It's, it's designing data visualizations for people with color deficiencies. There's lots of articles about that that um, I won't go into a ton of detail, and I didn't go to a ton, in a ton of detail in my blog post about this because Jeff Schaefer on his uh, website, uh, Data Plus Science, uh, has one of the best articles I've ever seen on designing um, data visualizations for people with color deficiency. So I'd really recommend uh, you read that. Um, but generally, we have to be mindful of it. You know, there is, I can't remember the percentage, 8% of, of men or something like that have uh, the red-green color deficiency. My father has red-green deficiency. He can't, for the most part, can't tell the difference between red and green. So it's really uh, important to know, you know, especially if your company loves to use stoplight colors, red, green, yellow, to, to, to show. And I used to do that in my days in Excel. So it's really important to, to be careful about that. Probably more of a problem than red, green are colors with kind of the same color tone. So we have this, this chart. And if you're not colorblind, you can probably see this pretty well. You see browns down here. You see reds here. This is looking at GDP per capita. Um, compared to ease of business. So I can see this really well. I have, I have no problem with the district distinguishing the red from the brown. Um, but if we simulate this, this will be a little bit small, but we put this in a simulator. I'll show you that momentarily. This is a bit small. Here's the normal vision up here, but you look down here and you can see you, can, you can't distinguish the red from the brown in any way, shape, or form. This is the most for common form of of color blindness, this is red green color blindness called deuter deuteronal. I can't say it, I'm not even gonna try. Um, and you can see it's really hard to see. But if you look at normal vision um, on, on the good side of this, show this, we're using this sort of blue and orange here. Um, normal vision up here, blue and orange, really easy to see. Same with the color blindness, it almost looks no different, really easy to distinguish. So it's really key that you make sure that your, your visualizations um, work for those with color, defic color deficiencies. Uh, how I advise people, well, first off, pretty much blue and anything will go, will, 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 um, will pass the test. So if you add a little bit of blue to something, it usually works. If you want to use like a red and green, if you make that green a bluish, it usually will, will pass the test. But the tool that I love to use is colorblindness.com, color-blindness.com. What you can do is you can come here, you can pick a file. Let's see, I've got uh, 
This is the blog post I got coming out on Monday talking about some features of the new version um, of Tableau. But you upload an image and then you can click through the different color blindness types to simulate those color blindness. This is gray and green. You're not going to have any issues with that. I probably should have had a better example, but um, but you can see which ones pass the test and which ones don't. I usually try to um, really just look at, at this one. This is the main one here, this green week, and, um, if, and try and make sure my visualizations fit that particular uh, color blindness. All right, so we went from one of these things that's important, really, really consider best practices to something that's just, for me, aesthetically bad. And this is these really wide highlight tables. I see it very often. People sometimes feel like they need to fill space on a viz. You know, they've got a couple of charts going down the page and they just use the highlight table to, to fill the space. I, I wouldn't do it. it. This chart at the top is hard to read to, for me. It's, it's far too wide. I have to almost like move my head to, to look at January over to December and it's just unnecessary. So, um, I, I just advise make make your highlight tables uh, nearly square. They don't have to be square. Um, I mean, I mean the individual cells. They don't have to be square, but pretty close to square makes it a lot easier to read. I can see that table without moving my head. I can quickly see the the, the darker areas, and and it's just easier to read. And on top of that, it's just really a lot a lot prettier. Um, one thing I'd recommend in a highlight table, just kind of a side note, is almost always use a marginal histogram, which basically be another bar chart out to the side and to the bottom that shows, you know, um, how Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday all compare as a total uh, across a year. And, and then likewise, uh, similarly, um, how the months compare um, for any day of the week. So just kind of a side note, and there's, there's a blog post linked to that as well. Stack bar charts. Uh, stack bar charts seem to be one of the favorite use, uh, favorite types of charts of, of tons of, of people out in the database community, uh, especially newer users. Um, I only have used a stack bar chart once or twice in my life. I think there's use cases for them. I just think they're hard to read. And what makes a stack bar chart hard to read is is they don't line up. So we can see this sort of green color. It's easy to compare this green color because they're all lined up against this axis. They all have the same starting point. So it's easy to tell that Q3 2016, we had more sales of bookcases than we did in Q3 of 2018. So that's easy to tell. But then how do we compare these red bars? They don't have the same starting point. It's really hard for me to tell if this one's larger or this one's larger. I honestly have no clue looking at it that way. So there's a couple of different things I recommend with a stack bar chart. You can unstack those bar charts so where you're measuring these individually. So we've got accessories, appliances, all these different categories on their own st starting point. Okay, so that's one thing that we can do. The problem with this is we do lose the full length of the bar. So we can't tell as easily that Q4 has more sales than every other quarter um, on, on this list. So that's really hard to tell when these things are broken. So Steve Wexler, I think you guys had him present uh, not that long ago. He wrote, oh, years and years ago, he wrote a blog post on, on uh, stack bar charts. And what he proposed, oddly enough, this is um, uh, from Jeff Schaefer, this is a big book of dashboards. This is a uh, viz that I use. This is uh, a viz that Jeff designed and I've redesigned over the past year um, for, to kind of uh, address some needs. And, and this is one of our work dashboards that we use a stack bar chart in. I think it's really effective here. But, um, but he talks about how we can use different tools to actually change the sorting of the bar um, so to move these colors to the axis and then you can more easily compare them. So you see you got the blue, you got the central region, and then he uses a drop down uh, parameter to change the sorting and puts the green to the axis so you can compare it. Even better than that is um, Ryan Sleeper. And I mentioned Ryan Sleeper a lot because the guy's amazing. That's the wrong thing. Ryan Sleeper implemented parameter actions so they can do this even, even easier. So click on the, the, the bar and it sorts it to the, to the axis. So just by clicking on the bar, you can easily compare the, the
south uh, region, or you can compare the central region just by clicking on the region. So <clears throat> that's probably the best of both worlds. If I were to build a, a, a stack bar chart, I would absolutely use that that met, that technique using a parameter action to click it, click on it, and sort it to the axis so that you can compare any. You can compare the total really easily, and you can compare the um, the individual segments uh, really, really easily. So really cool technique. <clears throat> All right, pie charts. So uh, we've, we hear in the data viz community that pie charts are awful and they're the devil and all that. Um, I don't necessarily agree. I, I will tell you at work, I have zero pie charts. Um, uh, usually there's a, a, something better. Usually a bar chart is better. Um, but um, I, don't, I don't have a ton of uh, hate for pie charts. I do have a ton of hate for pie charts with a ton of different segments. So. The one to the left is is impossible to read, if you ask me. And it's, the donut chart's even worse. Um, it's 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 really really difficult to read. If you were to try and label these segments, it'd be even more impossible. So try and label these segments with subcategory and the percentage um, is nearly an impossible um, feat. Um, and, and if you were able to do it, it would just be hideous and really hard to read. So if I'm going to use a pie chart, I only use them when I have for me, I only use them if I have two slices. I never use them for three. Uh, some people say three is okay. I, I agree. I, maybe three is okay, but in this case, we you know we understand like quarters of a circle or eighths of a circle pretty well, so we could probably estimate this pretty quickly. Even if this percentage was in here, we could probably estimate this to be around 18 to 20 percent, something like that. Um, with two slices. If we have a third slice, we might be able to tell the same thing, but it doesn't have a starting point at, at like 12 o'clock, so that, that makes it more challenging. That's why I typically only use it for two. So if I'm set on using a pie chart, I pretty much only use them with, with two colors. There's a blog post in here that talks about the problems with pie charts and the, how they're hard to tell. Um, I will tell you, in 99% of the situations, I will just use a bar chart. A bar chart for you know, 12 different subcategories is going to be way easier to read, way easier to interpret than, than a pie chart. Another argument can be made for, for radio charts, and, and I'll, I'll talk about radio charts and waffle charts. Um, I think both of them have their, their uses. Um, this, this chart is looking at, uh, this is actually a chart I used from a, a viz where I talked about the uh, college United States uh, college football in the United States. It looks at win percentage for the past 25 years, and these is this is sort of just like a, a bar fashion. It's probably unnecessary in work. I would absolutely use a normal bar chart, but um, sometimes there's cases for radio charts. And on uh, yesterday, I was building radio charts for work, and it has a, it's a perfect use case for it. When you do it, um, the one key is don't squish them. <laughs> I see this all the time with circular charts where they get squished. And there's really <clears throat> two different problems. One is you're squishing this vertically and not squishing it horizontally, which means the bars on the horizontal are actually longer than the ones vertically. So uh, this one is 93%. And if we actually rotate this around, it would actually be shorter than this bar that's 84%. Um, and that is um, makes a radio chart, which are a little bit difficult to read in the first place. It makes that even harder to read and more inaccurate. Um, but my main reason for not squishing a radio chart is it looks weird. <laughs> this this oval doesn't it just looks bad. This perfect circle looks beautiful, if you ask me. So I, anytime I am building a radio chart or if I'm building a waffle chart. Um, I always recommend you use a ratio, a one-to-one -one ratio. It should be square. It should be circular. It should be a one-to-one -one ratio all the way around. It just looks um, tons, tons better. Okay, labeling. Um, this is a pretty common issue. I see all the time where people just feel like they need to label every point. When I was an Excel guy, I used to do this all the time too. So you know. I, I don't want to uh, sound like I, I had all the answers my whole life. And pretty much every single one of these I used to do. So, um, and, and I've learned, you know, not to. So uh, there's no reason to, to label every point. You've got a couple things going on here. So number one, you got every point labeled, and then you have your show me axes. 
<clears throat> and you know, it's just it's it's cluttered. I can't really see what point goes with which label. <clears throat> it's very very difficult to read. And remember, we're we're building interactive data visualizations most of the time. Sometimes we're putting things in PowerPoint. So, but most of the time, you're 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 allowing a customer to actually, um, you know, interact with the biz. So that can use Hover. They can kind of get information. Generally, what I tell people is label a couple of different points. If you're going to show the axis, especially, um, you know, this is we can quickly tell this is a little bit over eighty thousand. We can tell that this is fifty thousand. It's pretty easy to see that when we when we use an axis. But um, I suggest that you use a combination of min maxes, of line ends, things like that. What I typically like to do is show a min and the max and a line end, which sometimes you'll need a, a dual axis to do that. Um, but um, I love to show the last value and I like to show the min and the max value. And then all the other values can kind of hinge off that. It's really uh, cleans up your viz, a lot easier to read. Um, you don't have all this clutter. So try and reduce the, the clutter in your, in your visualizations. Icons. I love using icons in, in visualizations. Absolutely love it. I think it makes it really easy. Uh, it's a, it's a nice, nice design technique. It makes things look pretty. Um, it also is really quick to understand. We can understand quickly that this is talking about 10 pin bowling and, I don't know, we sold, you know, 122,000 dollars of, of bowling equipment. 18,000 of boxing equipment, 145,000 of, of soccer equipment or football equipment, whatever you want to call it. The problem with this side is it's just inconsistent. It's, it, it, it has no rhythm. It has no, um, it, it just looks weird that we're using uh, this really standard outline icon, this sort of hand-drawn soccer ball icon, and then this, this colorful boxing icon. So anytime I use icons, I just suggest you use the, consistent icons with the same style, the same fill. Um, so, and one way you can do that is to um, use it from the same artist. So, I actually have a, a subscription to a product called The Noun, uh, a website called The Noun Project. It has millions of icons that you can download. Uh, you don't have to have a subscription. All you need to do is uh, attribute the author if, if you want them for free. So, you can actually go on that website, download icons for free. You just have to attribute the author and uh, on your on your viz. Um, this is very good for personal work, um, um, for paid for uh, work work. I tend to uh, uh, like to have a paid subscription, but you can really see the difference between this set of icons, this set of icons. Really consistent, really easy to understand. Uh, the same style. Um, if you uh, ever get the chance, if you have if you've not watched it, Chantilly Jagannath at, at the conference in 2019 did a whole um, presentation on design. One of the things she talked about in, in, in depth, uh, spends a lot of time on, is icons. So I'd really recommend you um, click on the on the link and, and we'll go watch her video. The whole video is incredible. The icon section is is really really nice as well. So all right. I see this commonly is maps and backgrounds. So we have the all these different style maps that you can bring in in innately in Tableau without using without leaving Tableau without using Mapbox. Um, but one of the problems I see is 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 that users don't uh, clean up their maps and they have this sort of big block, this big square that doesn't go along with the visualization. So the background of their of their viz is white, and then they have this big gray box that sort of um, just sits there. So one of the things I recommend is that you turn off as many layers <clears throat> and, and that you can in your in your maps. This, um, when I have this filled map in the United States, this turns I turn off all the all the um, the um, uh, what is it called? Uh, drawing a blank. Sorry, the uh, the base map. You turn off the base map, and you get rid of all this this stuff. Uh, there are problems with this. If I'm missing a state, the state's going to disappear. So there are problems with this. But what I advise is just try and clean it up as best you can. Get rid of the, the base map. Get rid of the unnecessary labels. We don't need Mexico labeled here. We are not interested in, in Mexico. We don't need to see Canada at all. So just clean it up if you can. Again, another blog post on minimalist maps. Um, one thing I wanted to show is um, if this is the standard map that comes into Tableau, 
But if you use some shape files, you can make your maps look just absolutely gorgeous. This is something, and again, it's going to reload. This is something that Ken did, uh, Ken Flowage did uh, for IronViz last year. And there is something about this, this particular projection. It's a different projection. Um, but there's something about it that just makes this map look beautiful. It's got this rounded edge. Um, it, this, this shape file actually brings uh, Alaska and Hawaii down below, so you don't have that problem with, you know, Alaska, this gigantic Alaska way out to the left and having to use three sheets to show them together. Using a shape file is a really great technique to, to have a beautiful, beautiful map and to kind of address some of these issues that I call like the Alaska effect. You know, Alaska looks the same size as the U.S. on, on that standard projection. So nice technique there to, to have some really beautiful maps. And if you need those shape files, I can certainly direct you to them. Transparency, I'm gonna probably have to move. We are uh, 15 minutes left of our time, so I'll have to move a little bit quicker. Um, transparency, if you have bubbles, especially in like a, a scatter plot, um, uh, jitter plots, stop plots, things like that, use transparency. On the left, you can see where no transparency is used. I see this all the time, surprisingly. Um, you can't tell the separation of the dots. You cannot um, see the density of the dots. You can't tell that there's a ton of, you can't tell if there's one dot here or, or 100 dots here. So it's really important to use transparency to show that. So here, it's really clear. So I tend to tell people, reduce the opacity, you know, show some transparency. And I like to use a border that's the same as the background. So here I'm using a white border around. We can see the separations of these circles. We can see there's a lot of density here. So um, use transparency um, to help separate those things. Diverging color palettes. So diverging color palettes, if you're not aware, that there's a difference between diverging and sequential color palettes. The diverging color palette has this sort of midpoint. So we have um, sales, a range of sales ranging from $920 to $460,000-ish. And it starts off a red, it goes to blue, but when you have a diverging color palette, there's this sort of white midpoint, okay? And when I look at this map, um, it's hard for me to understand what is going on. I don't know, is Texas, is, you know, I can tell that California has the highest sales. I can tell New York somewhere behind that, but these middle regions are really, it's really difficult to meet it for, to interpret. If we look at a sequential color palette, this is just going from very light blue to dark blue. It's really easy for me to tell. It's just really intuitive. California, New York, Texas, Washington, you know, South Carolina looks like the lowest, maybe West Virginia. It's really easy to, to tell uh, with a sequential color palette. The only time you should really use a diverging color palette is if there's some sort of natural midpoint. And those midpoints might be zero. So if you're looking at profit ratio, you might be seeing negative profit ratios and positive profit ratios. I tend to set my, my center point of a diverging palette at zero. So we have this natural midpoint. It may work the same way if you're comparing to a target or you looking at month over month or year over year, you're comparing to that prior period. So the only time I would ever recommend using a diverging color palette is if you had a natural midpoint like a target, a zero, or, or, or compared to a private, uh, prior period. Otherwise, sequential color palettes are just way more intuitive. I kind of touched on this before um, when I talked about highlight tables, because I see it so commonly with highlight tables, but any chart in general, any wide chart is difficult to read, you no know, complete waste of space. This bar chart is super long. I literally, again, like a highlight table, almost have to move my head to see the end of it. It doesn't add anything to our viz. So I just uh, just make it smaller. Just make it smaller. You still have the same comparisons. Um, e much easier to read this chart than, than that chart. So no sense in wasting that space. Okay, number precision. So unless you're, there are cases um, but unless you're working for NASA or, or something like that, there's almost never a reason to use four decimal points. You know, we don't need to show, um, if I'm talking about my um, uh, sales to date and I'm looking in regards to a target, I don't really need to say it's 38.1382% to target. 
38.1% in most cases is going to suffice. I don't really need that much precision. And it's the same way with, with larger numbers. I don't need to break out the $8.7 million to be $8,682,317. Almost never do I need that. In general, if you look at these two numbers compared to these two numbers, these are really more difficult to read. It takes me a few minutes or a few seconds to, to interpret the meaning of this, where these are really easy to read. Plus, they don't waste space. You can use them as bands at the top of your viz. Um, just a lot cleaner look. Now, again, every single thing I say today, there's exceptions to the rule. If you work for NASA, you may need to know things to the one one hundredth of a, of a decimal point. That's very possible. Uh, in most businesses, you just don't. So be careful with your number precision. Color encoding is also a, a tricky thing at times, and, and this, is, this is challenging. Um, and, and again, there's exceptions to this as well. But in this case, what I'm looking at is a scatter plot of profit by sales, two different scatter plots. In this one, I'm looking at corporate versus consumer, okay? And in this one, I'm looking at furniture versus office, and I'm using the same color code. So naturally, if I'm just kind of skimming through this biz, I look at this chart and I see corporate is yellow and blue is, is consumer. And then I look at this chart and I think the same thing. I think that the blue is consumer and the yellow is corporate when it's really two different things. Um, I think sometimes this is okay if it's clearly labeled. In this case, maybe it's okay. Um, but generally what I would recommend is using uh, different color, um, different color uh, palettes um, that when you're uh, representing two different types of things like this. So in this case, we use the yellow and blue for corporate and consumer, and then we can change it to like a red and a gray or something like that for furniture and office supplies. When we look at these two charts together, we can easily understand that these are not representing the same thing. When you look at these together, uh, it certainly looks like you are representing the same thing. So this is a really balanced, uh, this is a balance act. Before I told you don't use uh, different colors for every category. In this case, I'm telling you to um, use colors for each different category. Um, it's just a, kind of a balancing act. If they had 12 different scatter plots, will we use 12 different color plots? Maybe not. We probably have something that was really clear that all the different, you know, maybe we have some text or some, something that makes it very clear that each one of these is using the same color schemes, but representing different things. So um, just uh, kind of be mindful of that. Um, one of the things I see in visualizations, especially long form visualizations, ones that scroll down the page is when I'm looking at a viz or I'm looking at a website, what I use, and you won't be able to see this, is I use my, my little scroll bar on my mouse to scroll down the page, okay? And I do that, on, like I said, on websites, on long visits. Um, one of the problems with maps is you have these zoom, and a zoom, uh, the, the, the map will zoom with a mouse wheel scroll. So anytime I have a map that doesn't require zooming, you know, this is an area, this is, a, this is a Ohio, Cincinnati down here, there's really no reason to zoom into this map. So I always turn those layers off because if I don't, this is what inevitably happens when I'm scrolling through the viz. And it just is a pain. It's just an annoyance. I, I hear people complain about it all the time. So you just turn those map layers off if you don't need them. If I, there's no reason for me to explore and zoom into this map. Um, so um, what I suggest is just turn those map layers off. Okay? And if I scroll on this, nothing happens. It really keeps it in the same, same location. Alignment. Alignment is really, really key if you're not if you're a floater uh, versus a tiler. Uh, that can be more challenging. Um, I would suggest tiling charts together, but um, you want to make sure your axes are always lined up. This is not lined up. This isn't lined up with this. This isn't lined up with this. This isn't lined up with this. If we have four charts. I think this one should line up with this one. This one should line up with this one. This one should line up with this one, and this one should line up with this one. Should have this nice quadrant of, of things where all the axes uh, line up together. So just be very careful on your alignment. I'm pushing through because we're close to the end of our, our time here. Buttons, navigation buttons, um, or, or collapsible container buttons, um, you know, the show high container buttons. I, I see people use the standard button all the time with, uh, with a navigation that comes in like this, um, with a collapsible container that comes in with three little lines in the next. Um, maybe it's just me, but I hate them. <laughs> I hate the standard 
buttons. I, you know, it's not, it's not a bad button, um, but I always suggest giving the user some context. Tell the user what they're going to. What are they doing? You know, if they're opening a container, tell them what they're going to see. If they're going to a different uh, uh, dashboard, tell them where they're going. So I always recommend creating buttons. If you don't, um, if you've never created a button, you can do it really easily in PowerPoint. People go, PowerPoint, wow, really? I have a couple of blog posts and videos on, on drawing and PowerPoint, but creating a button is about the easiest thing in the world. If you go to insert shapes, I usually pick this sort of rounded square and we draw, drag this out. Um, I'll get rid of the shape fill, no fill. I'll make the outline a little bit thicker, something like that. And then we can add some text to the text box. This is a button. Center it, make it larger, something like that. All right, that needs some work. See this little yellow thing here? You can actually drag that in and make it a rounded button. Um, we can drag this. So we, we really quickly, in about 15 seconds, made a button. When you want to export it, you just select the whole thing, right click, save as picture, and now you have a button that gives your user some context of what they're going to be looking at. So I always recommend with every single button that Tableau puts in, um, that you put in um, your own custom buttons that gives additional context. Back in presentation mode, two more things, fonts. If you're not aware, uh, there's only about a dozen web safe fonts. These fonts are ones that will render the exact same thing on everybody's screen. Um, and the problem is you can use custom fonts if you want, but they'll only show in your screen. So here are four different custom fonts that I installed on my laptop. Um, kind of crazy different, different things. So I put this into this visualization and then I published it and then I went on my home computer and I pulled it up and these fonts look like this. So what happens is that font is not installed on my home computer and it just uses whatever font. It looks like it's kind of using some of the same fonts here. It just replaced these fonts with some other font. So if you want your fonts to always look the same, you need to use these web safe fonts. There's a list of them here. The other thing you can do is what I just showed in, in, in PowerPoint. You can actually use fonts that you type out text in PowerPoint and save it as an image. So if we go to here, and this is probably going to refresh, all these titles, all this text, this is all done in PowerPoint, actually. So I wanted a very specific font. Uh, hopefully it loads soon. Um, I wanted a very specific font, so I typed it into PowerPoint, saved it as an image, and brought it in, in as, as an image in Tableau. Okay, so if you want specific fonts, you can do that, um, or you just use the, the web safe fonts. All right, and the last thing I'm going to show is white space. White space is really key in your visualizations to avoid clutter and to improve flow. You can see this viz here where things are just shoved right next to each other. These bars leading into the other bars. These people are right next to each other, and we add a little bit of white space. We can really kind of separate this as this is all associated with Eric Dickerson, Edron James, Saquon Barkley. These are American football players. Um, and just adding some white space will help the, the flow. Now, I don't, I'm not an expert in white space, but I'll tell you who is, and hopefully he's on this call, is Pradeep Kumar. Pradeep is the master, in my opinion, of using white space. So here's a visit he just did this week. He, nothing's crammed. Everything flows. There's no clutter here. He's got spacing around the edges, so he's not running to the margins. Um, this thing is really easy to follow and work through. So he, it, you just go through his tablet public page. Almost every single one of his visitors is, is genius at using white space. I've got this little barn in my way here. Uh, one of the most recent ones he did was carbon footprint of, of food. So, gorgeous use of white space. So if you ever want to be inspired by great design or um, by good use of white space, go check out Pradeep's uh, profile uh, pr under Pradeep Kumar G, uh, incredible use of white space. All right. And that's my thank you slide. So remember all these things are kind of soft rules. They're done, they're, sometimes they're there's um, exceptions, there's always exceptions to the rules. So uh, this is kind of just my breakdown of ways, 26 ways to make uh, um, bad design, good design. So with that, I will certainly take any questions that you guys have. 
Thank you, Kevin, for sharing all the best practices. We have a couple of questions. The first question is, while designing a layout in Tableau, which option do you prefer, fixed or floating off approach? Are you talking about the, the dashboard layout or so, so I, oh, the, the dashboard size I always fix. Um, automatic layout dashboards are very, very hard to predict. So I typically design, you know, work dashboards, I try to design this 1200 by 800. It's, it fits a normal uh, computer monitor very, very well. Now, if you have mobile users, you do have to, I would always recommend designing a, a mobile view using the phone layout on Tableau. Um, it's a little tricky. Sometimes you have to duplicate your sheets and things like that. But um, in general, we don't do a lot of mobile, so I design everything fixed. Uh, about 1,200 by 800. We do have exceptions to that. So we do have some long form dashboards that work. In my personal work, I always use fixed as well, but sometimes I use completely different sizes. That's very random. As far as uh, how I actually design, I use a combination of floating and, and tiling. Um, there's an incredible video by Curtis Harris. If you search on YouTube for Curtis Harris layout containers tableau, you'll find it. This is a game-changing video. I recommend everybody that ever uses Tableau you, or reads it. And how, how I design a dashboard is based on that. I, I personally float two containers to start. I float a header container and a body container, and then I tile within that. And by doing that um, versus just tiling everything, you, you avoid that crazy hierarchy in, the, in your layout. If you look at your layout, you have like that tiled thing that kind of goes down the screen and it's impossible to see. If you, if you float your container to start, you'll avoid all of that, uh, that uh, difficult to read hierarchy. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Just, I think I will take the next question is, do you want to recommend top favorite books on information design that you would recommend to beginners? Could you repeat the question, Sagar? I'm sorry. Uh, what are your top favorite books on information design that you would recommend? Yeah. Uh, the, my, it, my absolute favorite is Big Book of Dashboards that was written by my boss. And I'm not just, uh, you know, because he's my boss, but uh, that was written by Jeff Schaefer, uh, Steve Wexler, and Andy Cotgrave, um, three absolutely brilliant guys in, in the data viz community. Um, these guys are, are, are centric to, to Tableau. Um, they're all Tableau users and Andy Cograve works for Tableau and the other two are Tableau Zen Masters. So it's really specific. It, it's not specific to Tableau, but pretty much every chart in there is Tableau. It's, it's, it's about building work dashboards. And that's really why we, we do this. We can have fun in our personal lives, but we do this um, to, to make a living, right? So. Uh, Big Book Dashboards, in my opinion, is is the best when it comes to building um, um, work dashboards. I love I love being creative with Tableau, which you guys probably probably know. Um, so there's a couple other books that I love as well. So uh, there's one called the the Big Book of Circles. I think it's called the Big Book of Circles, something like that. It shows just a bunch of radial charts and it's just gorgeous. Um, I have uh, all, uh, stacks of books over here that I I, I love, but. Um, um, absolutely love the big book dashboards. That would be my number one recommendation. Okay. And you'll see, and, and to be quite honest, you'll see a lot of that. This this whole uh, blog post and this presentation was was vetted by by Jeff Schaefer. We spent hours together um, cleaning this this uh, blog post up, um, and a lot of these best practices you'll see in in the big book dashboards as well. Thank you, Kevin. I think we are already over time. Do you want to take more questions or should I just collate all the questions and submit across to you? I am more than happy to take as many questions as you like. So um, I can stick around, okay. um, but if people need to go, I, I, I completely understand. Okay, so the next question is, so what do you think about design for mobile? Is this something we should all consider? Um, I think because a lot of the, you know, Andy Cotgrave's favorite phrase is it depends. So in my work, um, we don't have, we, we have a fairly small company and, and I'm designing dashboards mainly internally. Um, we don't have 
We don't have a lot of mobile users. We just don't use mobile. So we don't design for mobile ever at work. We've never designed a, a dashboard for mobile use. Now, there are certainly cases, you know, if, you're, if your users are using mobile, then I absolutely recommend you design for mobile. Mobile designs are, are tricky because they're so different than, than your, da uh, uh, like, a desktop design. Um, and like I mentioned before, you know, some charts that you have on a desktop design won't work for mobile. So sometimes you have to duplicate the charts and clean them up. So it is challenging design for mobile. But the only time I would recommend design for mobile is if you know you have mobile users. There's other ways around um, mobile views as well. I have uh, something on my blog post that says it's um, on my blog called, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the article, but um, post your viz with something, I don't remember exactly what it's called, but there's tricks to actually taking a desktop view and making it easier to read in mobile without designing a mobile view. So you can check that out on our website, um, But yeah, generally, so and I'm working on a project for Tableau right now, um, and uh, one of the keys is they want the mobile view. So I, you know, I have, I have done the mobile views. Um, they're just a bit time consuming. So if your users need mobile views, design them. If they don't, don't. That's kind of my um, answer there. And the next question is, should we be careful with using progressive bars when we have more than five categories? Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. It's about uh, when we have more than five categories, should we careful of using progressive bars? Using what? I'm uh, sorry. Prog progressive bars? Can you hear me? Progressive bars. I don't, I'm not sure I understand the term progressive bars. I think we can move on to the next question, no problem. So the next Sorry, question there, no problem. problem. I think, yeah, we will go ahead and mention it. And, and, and if there's any, if there's other questions, you can certainly send them. You have my email. You can send them to me via email. I'll be happy to to answer those yeah. if, if we don't get to some of them. But yeah, we, we again, we can take as long as you like. But if for some reason you need some clarification, I can come back to them. Right. You can just take the last question. The question is about when the icons are not purchased. How do you effectively attribute a design? Now, fairly without distracting from the this. That's a good question. So let me just go to um, the noun project. They have really specific guidelines on how you attribute. I'm going to sign out of this just so that it asks me to. Where is the sign out? I got this little windows in the way. Log out. Okay. Let's go to an icon. And it says, let's see, I can't remember what it says. Um, now, shoot, man, it's not going to tell me. Um, if you create an account, you create a free account on the Noun Project, it specifies exactly how to um, attribute them. Um, I think that it's, it, it just tells you the, the content you need to provide. I don't think that you necessarily have to say, um, put it right here on screen. I think you could probably put it in, what I tend to do with sources and things, in fact, um, no, I don't have one here, but um, I tend to put sources in a collapsible container. So I would put a little info icon where a button you can click. Let me see if I have one up here. Um, this one may have it. Um, no, I don't. Typically, what I show is sources, and then I show a little info icon where uh, a person can click, and it brings up a, a, a collapsible container that has the sources in that. And I would typically do my attributions in the sources, something like that. Um, you could probably even even have another window if you wanted. You could have another icon or collapsible container, show hide uh, container um, next to your icons where they can click and get the attribution. I don't think it's necessary to have it written right on screen, um, but I would I would follow the, the guidelines of the noun project or whatever, uh, wherever you get your icons to properly um, attribute the author. Um, but I think using a collapsible container and putting that information in a collapsible container is, is more than sufficient. 
Okay. I think with that, thanks a lot, Kevin, for your time today. I know it was very early for you, but I appreciate your time. No problem at all. I'm happy to be time. here. And any last thoughts you want to just talk about? I'm sorry? You want to talk about your website so that people can just go ahead and... Sure. It's uh, BloodRidgeTwins.com. Um, it's it's a, a website that Ken and I share. Uh, we had our individual websites, KevinFlurridge.com and KenFlurridge.com. Ken had his for four years. I had mine for a couple years. And in, in December, we decided to merge them because nobody could remember who uh, was it on my site or was on Ken's site or a certain blog post. So to make everything easier on everybody, we merged them. Um, and it's been a lot of fun. We pretty much put out a blog post every single week. One of us, we rotate between the two of us. Um, I have more recently with new, the release of new version. We'll have a, a, a load of them, but um, flourishtwins.com, check it out. Um, there's lots of content there. And um, yeah, if you ever have any questions for me ever, you can always reach out to me directly um, on, uh, on Flourish Twins on Twitter, Pluralage Kev, on LinkedIn, or you can always send me an email directly. I'm happy to, to chat with people and, and help out if I can. So um, thanks for having me and, and I appreciate, uh, appreciate you having me and uh, maybe uh, in a year I'll be on again. <laughs> we'll make this an annual thing, Cigar. Sure, sure, Kevin. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you guys. Perfect. Take care, everyone. Be safe. Have a great weekend ahead. Take care, goodbye. Bye, Kevin. Thank you. Bye-bye.